first off, some announcements. Uh, so tonight over in Ardex 165, um, we are having a uh, panel about employment in the broadcast industries. So that's from 6 till 8 p.m. Uh, it was an RSVP thing and over 30 people replied, but uh, if you want to go check it out, Sheila said they won't turn anyone away. So they're going to have a panel of three folks. Uh, it's shift, the composition of it has shifted a little bit, but there are people who can talk to getting employment in uh, broadcasting. So it could be interesting um, So check that out if you want. Uh, on Friday at noon in ArtX 170, we're going to have the first meeting of the Broadcasting Club. Thank you very much to folks who are uh, out there busy letting people know that this is happening. So uh, City College uh, has a whole infrastructure for clubs called the Interclub Council. And um, so there's clubs of all sorts. They're student-run organizations. Uh, they have a small budget. Um, they have faculty advisors, and basically it's up to the students to determine what they want to do with the club. But there seems to be a bunch of people interested in getting on radio. Um, so one of the things the club might be doing is, um, you know, organizing a return of the radio station. No matter, you know, we don't know exactly how much, how much airtime we can get going, but we'll see. And so that would be a streaming radio station over the internet. We don't have a broadcast license here. Other things that the clubs could do could be organized tours. In the past, we visited um, where we visited the Giants Stadium. Uh, we visited uh, KTVU, a bunch of other places. So that could be something the club could work out or have guests in to talk about different things that club members are interested in. And so, you know, regular meetings uh, to determine that, mostly on Fridays. So this Friday at noon uh, in Ardex 170, and if you were not exactly in 170, we'll be real close by. You'll see people there, I hope. Uh, also, next week, uh, we're having another of those in-class uh, meetups. So the last one was about uh, programming. Um, this next one is advertising. So on October 10th, uh, that's a mandatory day to be here. Uh, let me just make sure I put that in the list of days that you actually absolutely have to be there. Let's see here. It's Tuesday. It's Tuesday. Thank you, folks. Where is it saying? And that's not a mandatory attendance. OK, so good thing we checked. Uh, so uh, I'll have to do the same thing, make it possible to do it in class as well as to make it possible to do it remotely. Uh, <laughs> you can tell you can see my enjoyment of that. <laughs> Anyhow, so uh, uh, be prepared for the same sort of, uh, I provide you with some materials, we do an, an activity in class, and those who can't attend uh, will have to do the, you know, work with the materials on their own. and. Uh, turn something in. So maybe I can organize that a little bit better this time. Richard? Two times like last time, because we had to do it twice. Yeah, I, you know, it kind of, you had to do it twice. You mean it went a Tuesday and a Thursday, right? I mean, we had to do it in class, and then we had to submit it online, too. Uh, well, you had to submit the second part, which was to, oh, right? Yeah. So I'll try to clear that up since, yeah, it might, we can make that cleaner, whether it's like everybody does everything or not. But I agree. Uh, that was uh, learning pains, whatever. <laughs> so uh, that's on the 10th. So prior to that, if you could just uh, pay attention to advertising around you, um, just you know, just try to sensitize yourselves to um, what kind of ads you are seeing out there, whether you're seeing. Obviously, you're seeing billboard display ads. You're seeing uh, television ads if you watch TV. So um, your radio ads, and how about online stuff as well? So all of those could be, um, you know, stuff that we can talk about potentially. So uh, this little thing that's up there on the module is just basically just start start paying more attention to advertising over the next week or so, so that you've got some kind of ammunition to work with to share. Um, on uh, next Tuesday, right? Okay, cool. 
So are we supposed to like write a paper about it? No, it's going to be an in-class kind of uh, assignment. So what I'll do is I'll, uh, like the last one, uh, you know, I taught you broadcast uh, programming concepts and then asked you, okay, use those and interpret this uh, sheet. So I will supply you with other concepts and, you know, we'll probably build a sort of a campaign or something uh, uh, together, you know, trying to keep in mind those concepts. So uh, it's, uh, I give you concepts, ask you to do something with it, and hopefully we get it done in one class. <laughs> I still don't get it, though. Uh, okay, so... Exactly. Are we supposed to, like, turn it? I don't know yet, JP. Okay. Okay, so uh, what I'm asking for now is look at advertising, and next class I will have the paperwork to hand out and give to you folks, okay? okay. Uh, the last time, I think it worked out okay, but we'll see. Cool. Uh, add awareness and uh, yeah, okay, cool. So today we will be talking about personal digital devices. Primarily your smartphone, I guess, is where we're at with it now. Uh, but then the history of both the cell phone and uh, other personal devices. Uh, so, uh, well, let's just start off with like a little audio-visual overview, kind of, and then we'll see. It's from England, but uh, it's well produced. Just a, this is a very quick history of the telephone. Mr. Watson, come here. Supposedly the very first telephone call. It was made by Alexander Graham Bell in 1876. But the year before, he made the crucial breakthrough, namely that you could transmit more than just a single note electromagnetically, you could transmit whole sounds. And he did it using this gallo frames telephone, a vibrating reed against a diaphragm. The telephone was born. Up until as recently as the 1970s, telephone calls were connected by a copper wire from your house all the way to a local telephone exchange like this, manned by, invariably, women, who would connect your call into the socket of another household. Hey presto, you could chat. But the post office believed correctly that people couldn't remember long telephone numbers. So instead, everyone had a code. There were hundreds in London, and my one in North London was Canonbury. C-A-N. And to this day, I still have 226 in my telephone number. This can lay claim to being the very first mobile phone. It was used in the 1930s by a Brighton police station to speak to bobbies on the beat. Though it was one way. If the policeman wanted to speak to the station, they had to go and find a pay phone. But hey, it was a start and it led to this beauty, which is Britain's very first mobile phone, not using radio waves, using an analog cellular network. And it was launched in 1985. Maggie Thatcher liberalised the telephone market in the 1980s and that allowed for the first time competition and on the 1st of January 1985 Vodafone made the first call. I particularly love this 1986 XL model designed for the first time to fit into a shirt pocket. Don't laugh, it's not much bigger than an iPhone 6. The story ends, for now at least, with the smartphone. Little mini computers in your pocket. And to make a telephone call, you use a digital network. Though ironically, not many people use these things to speak to one another. They mostly use them to send messages, search for information, or watch little videos, like this one. Okay, I guess there were some key things in there. <laughs> Any ideas on that, folks? It was quick. It was quick. quick <laughs> A quick history. Gotcha. Um, oh, yeah. One other thing. It amazes me at. at how big those phones, cell phones, whatever they were, uh, in the Several 1980s pounds. compared to now. They've really changed sizes. Miniaturization, yeah, and of course the price came down too. Although or the flip phone seems kind of pricey. Instance. Do you guys uh, do you remember any? Uh, let's see, 
I remember PDAs, personal digital assistants. Anyone yeah. seen one of those? Mason? Yeah. And not in a long time. time but yeah, right, yeah. Then it was Blackberries after that. Right, yeah, PDAs, Blackberries. <laughs> but people were uh, like a sidekick, you remember a sidekick? That what was a sidekick? Flip. Oh, the, uh, yeah. The sidekick? Yeah. Oh, like, okay. Like this. Yeah, flipped up. It was like a. So it was a design of cell phone that it made a, it easy a to text. Yeah, it was a slide, not a flip. Okay, but, okay. Yeah. But everybody had that. Gotcha. So Blackberry had text. Kind of like that, but it was. And it had like, like a little analog stick, right? It was yeah. this way. Uh, What's that? It had a little like analog stick, kind of. Yeah. An analog stick. What did that? Oh, in order to select stuff? Yeah, yeah. Like oh, some okay. people would have like a cell phone, and then they would have that phone for texting, and then they'd have a phone for calling. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. A whole bunch of different devices. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So we got Blackberry. We've got. Uh, uh, we've got. Um, there you we know, pagers. Now. Cell phones and text, text enabled, I guess, but that well, would still be this, right? Nokia's, the really small, like, gray ones. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Oh the razors. <laughs> Nokia's. The little orange guys. Does anyone have any personal recollections of a PDA? Never used it. Those things? Oh, interesting. Okay. For business. For business, mostly, yeah. I mean, I, I eventually got a Palm Pilot, but this is way back. But, uh, there's, there was one, uh, the most sophisticated was the Apple Newton, which was of a design that, uh, where would it be now? 20 minutes on the Newton? Oh, here we go, a commercial. So this is, uh, this is what the Newton was back in its day. So it was discontinued in Newton's about a lot of things, really. I think the part that excites me the most has to do with helping people keep in touch. The idea behind Newton is that it's an assistant, something that actively helps you as you capture, organize, and communicate your ideas and information. The possibilities are just limitless. When you think about it, the most natural way to get your thoughts down is to jot or to sketch. We wanted Newton to be that natural. Say you're on a train or a plane or at a little cafe. You can write a fax. Say you want to send that fax to Margaret. You just highlight Margaret's name in the text, tap fax. And Newton will automatically fill out a fax cover sheet with Margaret's number on it. We've built in Newton intelligence so that Newton knows enough about what you're trying to do to help you do it. The beauty of Newton is that any page you have in your Newton can be sent through email. Text, graphics, pages from your calendar, business cards. You just select email and, well, you send it. Simple as that. It seems to happen all the time these days. You're expecting a really important message, but you can't guarantee you're going to be easy to reach. By just getting the Newton messaging card, you can get your message wherever you go. You can share anything that's in your Newton with anyone else. Using Newton's built-in infrared networking capability, you can beam things to other people. It's pretty handy in meetings to just be able to send someone something instantly your business card or the notes or a calendar page. You can even jot notes to jog your memory later or set an alarm. Or add a task to your to-do list. Kind of a communication center or a universal inbox and outbox. The Newton Connection Kit lets you connect your Newton to your PC or your Macintosh and share and store information. This is all about being in charge of your life being able to have information so you can keep in touch with people. It's going to help you keep track of your time and your contacts, but it's going to do it in a way that's not intrusive to your lifestyle. I'd say that Newton is really peace of mind, right in the palm of your hand. What do you think? <laughs> yeah, now I, I, mean, it did, I was it did, thinking that too. It did everything except make phone calls, and it was so, I can't believe how ahead of its time it was. And I can see where ideas and inspiration to the iPhone would eventually iPad, come from this. Yeah. I mean, they were on that. What year was this? 96. Yeah, they were it was on just it. continued in 97 because so it, it didn't work. Years later, yeah. Yeah. It didn't work. I was like, what? Oh, of course I, not. It wasn't that short. I don't that's, remember that's it the too problem much. With, yeah, yeah it, it, it took eight years to develop, and it was sold for five years. And then they, and when Jobs went back to Apple, he canned it because it, it was a laughing stock, especially the, especially the the um, the 
the right. text recognition, yeah, it couldn't recognize anything you wrote. Oh. It looks slow even if it's commercial. Yeah, yeah, the, the person writing is kind of going like this, yeah. but then it's like one letter every second yeah, or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, interesting. And the other thing I was noticing is given the, you know, the whole Apple vibe and all their advertising for years now, you know, this seems like such a, it's like another company or something, right? Yeah. Because the, 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 the imaging is so different. But a part of that is because Apple in the 90s was run by John Scully, who was a Pepsi, uh, mm -hmm. he was a Pepsi executive, right? Jobs, Jobs got kicked out. Uh, and uh, and Scully basically ran the company like any other corporation doing things like this. Although, again, what I'm amazed by, to speaking to your points, is that there's so much of what eventually you can now effectively do with an iPhone. You know, the, the ideas of what you wanted, what people could use this type of mobile personal uh, technology, they're there. It's just they didn't have yet the, you know, the uh, the technology. Even the you know plug-in modem card you know to to connect. It's huge. I know, yeah, <laughs> for sure, for sure, yeah. But uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, we've made huge strides in miniaturization, I guess, between now and then. So that's that's an interesting one. So so that would have been you know the ultimate personal digital assistant, of which there were obviously cheaper and less functional versions, you know, the Palm Pilot was one. So I'm curious, what happens if you lost the pen? Could you uh, it wasn't, the screen was not like finger sensitive, and yeah, that's apparently one of the things that Jobs didn't like. I'm not sure, but one thing he didn't like was that you had to have a stylus, and he didn't want that. He wanted like, So they were able to sell the pens, like extra pens or something, they could increase the price on that. Probably. They know people need. But I think the whole thing was like $400 or something like that. It was really expensive. Although now, you know, your phone's as much as a computer, so and we happily pay it. So they worked that out. But that, that would have been, uh, you know, the, the, the ultimate of the PDAs, which, you know, if you, if you look at PDAs and phones converging, that's, you're getting into a smartphone. That's basically where we're, where we're going with that, or where we've been with that, I guess. Um, okay, let's take a look at uh, some of the slides, and uh, then we can talk. Eventually, I found out a lot more information regarding uh, um, standards for um, telephony and for the internet as well. I have a longer history of the uh, of the cell phone as well that we can look if we if we wind up having enough time to do that. What are we picking out here? We've seen the Newton, the Palm Pilot. We've seen you know already the interest in connecting the device to the internet was there. They had picture transmission way back then? I'm not sure. That's insane. Yeah. I, I'm not sure exactly how much you could share that way through, uh, through, the, um, through the Newton. Some stats on the diffusion of the mobile phone. OK, a couple of things to pick out from here then. Early cell phones are functioning on what's called circuit switching, and they're analog uh, designs. So those big, heavy uh, cell phone designs that you're looking at are also extremely inefficient in their use of, of bandwidth of, of the radio spectrum. The reason for that is every phone call would require an open circuit uh, in order for people to talk on the phone. So uh, the phone would basically be disconnected uh, from the cell phone network. And when you made a call, the phone would have to initiate a, you know, find a place on the network and then connect to another phone. And at that point, a circuit would be open the entire time that people were talking, even if there was silence or whatever. A switch in cellular technology to packet switching was a huge improvement uh, for the supplier side because what that meant is when you didn't talk, Basically, uh, uh, this, the, uh, the, the connection could be broken, and you could fit in a bunch of other calls within the same amount of bandwidth. So it didn't require an open circuit between two phones. When they switched over to a packet switching uh, uh, strategy, basically, as you talked, there would be packets flying back and forth on the network between the phones. Uh, but you could squeeze in a lot more packets 
in the downtime, which, you know, where people weren't interacting. So there was a big, big improvement, transformation in, in, uh, in, in how, in, in effective use of the spectrum that was out there. Um, when I'm talking about spectrum, I'm talking about the radio spectrum, right? Because um, all, of, uh, all of these technologies are using um, radio spectrum, which is shared with television and with radio. Okay, here we go. Boom, there we are. So uh, as we zoom in and move around, We've got a huge chunk still for AM radio, and believe me, they would like to shut that down and redistribute it for, um, uh, you know, cellular data applications. Uh, here we've got um, TV channels which are coming in uh, at the bottom of the FM radio. So I don't know if you guys ever had that experience, but you could, if you had one of those radios where you could tune with a dial, you could actually tune down and get broadcast channel sound. Well, maybe this is. Before your day, but I remember uh, looking, looking, <laughs> looking at stuff and listening to it on the radio at the same time. So then you'd have FM radio there, and as you move up, you're going to get uh, a lot more. You're, you're going to get into mobile. You're going to get into satellite frequencies, um, radio astronomy, way up there. Um, and can we find a good chunk of land mobile? So um, those frequencies would have been defined and then actually auctioned off by the FCC at a, at a certain point. Suppliers would actually bid to use those frequencies, which raised a certain amount of money. And so they're quite valuable. And uh, you know, as you can see, you can fit uh, a lot of cellular service into the frequency allocation that old analog broadcasting has. So, uh, you know, sooner or later, they would uh, love to uh, close down the, uh, the radio um, that's already there. Of course, the TV channels are already gone, uh, but radio is still hanging out there, keeping a lot of, um, a, a lot of spectrum tied up. So spectrum is a, kind of, is a limited thing, and the more efficiently you can use it, the better. And given if you're a cell, cellular or data operator, uh, you know, the more calls that you can squeeze into a given slice of bandwidth, the better it is for you because, you know, you can have more subscribers and handle more traffic. So uh, that's, that's an important um, transition when you can uh, get there. Yeah. It's allocated by the FCC? Yes, that's right. So all of these, and of course, they're also taking an account to ship to shore, emergency, uh, the longest waves travel the furthest, so when you get down to the lowest frequencies below the AM uh, spectrum, you see that it's like maritime mobile, radio navigation for air, airlines and stuff. So they also have to account for all that as well. So all of that has to be fit in, you know. And then each country has its own allocations, but there's also international agreements too for setting aside certain bands for you know, planes flying all around the world and stuff have to be able to, you don't want to shift over every time they move to some other airspace. So, uh, you know, it's a big cooperative activity allocating spectrum. And uh, it's big business in terms of, you know, grabbing more spectrum and auctioning it off for new data services, basically, which is what we're really hungry for. So as, as soon as they can do away with the terrestrial radio, I think they will. They're no. looking forward to it. Well, it's, you know, if we continue to have the penetration of, of uh, you know, wireless uh, smart devices, they're going to make they're going to make way for it for sure. But I understand your affection for radio. I share it. Um, let me see here. Some some protocols. I promised to do a little research on this, and uh, over the weekend I had a bit of a chance to do this. Um, so we had, uh, and this, this feeds into our discussion of, uh, of uh, cell phones and of you know, what's going on in terms of, of uh, uh, data, data exchange over, over wireless. What we've been looking at is, is uh, last class we talked about, last week, was it last class, the other one? We talked about uh, TCP IP as being uh, the, the protocol for the internet, right? Internet protocol, 
And then the TCP, I can't remember what they stand for, but those, that was another, another protocol that layers on top of the internet protocol. Uh, so standards that are operating, whether it's through uh, you know, the wired internet connections or through the wireless internet connections that our, our cell phones are using to exchange data, those, those standards actually, they can stack on top of each other. So IP is uh, internet protocol is a, is a really, you know, almost ubiquitous standard now because of so many, so many uh, uh, devices are designed to take advantage of the internet. And looking ahead to the last item in, in this chapter, which we'll talk about on Wednesday, the internet of things, uh, stand by for an explosion of devices that are going to be connected to the internet using forms of IP, but also other standards that stack on top of IP. So remember, internet protocol is basically the, the, the language that computers speak to each other as they exchange data, right? So that, that's what we're calling a protocol. The, the, uh, a, uh, computers on the network have to know like, how they're actually going to exchange the data. So the internet protocol uh, um, is uh, what's called a best effort packet delivery system. So remember we said that data is chunked into packets in a packet switch network like the internet or like our cell phone uh, data services now, which is you know, the topic of this week. Uh, by best effort, what they mean is that uh, uh, the, uh, the packets uh, contain uh, standardized number of bytes of information, whether they're pictures or audio or text or whatever. The packets have a standardized size. And they have uh, a header, which is kind of like an envelope. So it's, it's like the header says, OK, you know, what protocol are we using? What is this packet? And it has an address that it is directed to that address. So IP basically contains that, the packets of data sent to an address. But IP in itself doesn't have a system for making sure that those packets arrive. So TCP, which you remember from the video we looked at, was developed for local computer users to interact with mainframes, like back in the 70s, right? TCP actually verifies that the packets get to where they were supposed to get to. So TCP is reliable. It's ordered. It error checks. It makes sure that all of the packets have arrived where they should. So that's is the majority of, of uh, you know, your web pages and, and uh, most other current in internet applications are using TCP IP. The basic IP to send out the packets and TCP to make sure that it's all working right and that all the packets have been received. This is a little bit slow, though, uh, because of the error checking and the verification. So there are other protocols used on the internet, and one that I never heard of before is UDP. Um, so you could have also UDP IP. And this is uh, designed for the fastest possible delivery. Uh, but it is not necessarily uh, uh, as reliable as TCP. So this apparently, I was reading up on it, is uh, used for like uh, video conferencing and uh, applications like that, where what you want is a real-time streaming connection as quick as it can possibly be. So I don't know if you've ever been on a Skype conversation or something where things kind of freeze up, part of the image will, uh, you know, part of it will refresh and not another part. So you're actually, you're seeing the missing packets at that time or if audio stutters. Um, that's also what's happening as, as UDP, which is trying to push a whole lot of, of video information to you as fast as it can, doesn't always get all of its packets lined up in time to show you the next frame of video. So um, that's, that's a, a whole other thing that's, that's going on over the internet which is not HTTP, which is the hypertext transfer protocol, which is the thing we're using most as we look at web pages, right? But another thing that I found out, which I wasn't aware of, HTTP, while it is the protocol for, you know, exchanging web pages, which we know are written up in HTML and stuff, 
HTTP is also has a bunch of other commands. We usually use what's called the get command, which is like when I put in a URL, I put in an address in my browser, and I say go to Amazon.com, and that HTTP is using its, its functionality called get. But it also has other functions, place, delete, a bunch of others that you could look up, but that aren't really used as much on the web as we know it now. Uh, because mostly what we're doing is our client, our, our local computer is calling out saying, give me the New York Times, you know, update, all of that stuff. And as we said, on the web page, it's pulling together files from all over the place on the internet, pictures, advertisements, stuff like that. Uh, but HTTP apparently can do a lot more than that. Uh, so looking ahead to the internet of things, uh, which, you know, we can talk about it more on Wednesday, but, but it's an exciting new use of the internet, which will be all kinds of devices uh, taking a place on the internet, which are not run through browsers. They're not devices that are, you know, will call up information as a give me, give me Amazon.com, but instead use the internet, but exchange information in more limited fashion. Um, Amazon itself uh, here <laughs> has, you know, what is it, Alexa or something? They've got, they've got voice recognition devices that'll sit in your kitchen and you say, uh, order me some uh, dish soap. And uh, it will recognize and it will, you know, uh, start, uh, you know, storing an order for you on your web page at Amazon or in your account or whatever. Um, so we're going to see more and more of devices like that. They're connected to the internet. They transfer data. They use HTTP, just like a web browser would, but they eliminate the browser and instead use other ways of interpreting what you want. So this is a start towards the Internet of Things, which could have drones, cameras like this, uh, so on and so forth. Jenny? Out of curiosity, you just made me think of one ad, uh, Xfinity, which has a very strong pole in Northern California, is always promoting that talking remote of theirs. Interesting. Um, how does it, are you aware of it? Uh, no. So Xfinity is a brand of Comcast, I know, so they yeah. tend to put all their more advanced digital stuff in there, including their streams. I, I was just wondering whether it was using the same technology or similar. So we could look it up. Yeah, I'll, I'll be happy to look it up before next class. It's a great idea because I think that is, you know, again, I'm not sure, but just thinking about it, like the Internet of Things is really referring to a lot of devices which are a lot dumber than a personal computer or a smartphone uh, because all the processing power is located uh, in servers. So it's, it's a cloud, a lot of cloud-based uh, um, uh, devices. In other words, you know, you could, it's the difference sort of between a Chromebook and a regular PC, right? I mean, does anyone have a Chromebook? No? Okay. I mean, those are, those are, uh, um, those are personal computers with a really stripped down operating system and very little memory in them. Uh, but what they do is they'll, they'll allow you to run apps that exist in the cloud, like Google Docs, for instance. So Chromebook, the Chrome operating system uh, is uh, you know, created by Google. Uh, and the idea there is, is a, a change in how you build computers so that the computer in your hand is a lot less uh, powerful uh, and functional than a typical PC. So it's a lot cheaper and its battery can last a lot longer because it does a lot less. But what it needs is a connection to the internet and there in the internet all the processing will be done. So for instance, you could have a cheap little, you know, like I don't know, maybe $50 to manufacture a remote control uh, which has a microphone in it and a, you know, a converter to change your voice into digital form but then it will get sent to a computer elsewhere in the cloud that can actually process your voice and do the voice recognition. So that way, you know, all of these devices can be small and cheap and they don't have a lot of processing power in them. So as you upgrade your voice recognition capabilities, you don't need to change this out because this is just a microphone and, a, and an analog to digital converter, you know, and those we're good at. Those we can make real cheap. 
but all of the improvements in voice recognition or everything that they want to build into that particular app would be off-site. So then this is cheap and all the progress can go on in servers that are elsewhere. So you don't have to update. So we can check it out and see that. But that would be a great example of the many, many different devices that are coming our way. And remember, that would be like a microphone that's constantly open in your house, right? So you could just leave it on the table and say, I'd like to watch some TV. Boom, TV's on, you know? Uh, yeah, what was the name of that show I was watching like on Sunday? Boom, you know, et cetera. So yeah, Creepy. I guess, yeah, there's, a, I think a whole, I mean, how do you people feel about having a microphone in your house that's always on? <laughs> Richard says, bring it on. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I, you know, I mean, I, I, other thoughts? I mean, is, is I'm it? I'm split on it. Yeah. After using the Xfinity remote, I never, you know, watching the commercials, I thought it would be really dumb and, like, I would never use it. But then you realize you, it saves you, like, minutes typing out stuff and then searching with scroll buttons or arrows or whatever. And it, it saves you like a good five minutes sometimes. Wow, does it work well enough? Five minutes to just 10 seconds, you know. I wanna watch Matthew McConaughey movies or, you know, movies yeah, with boobs or something like that. Everything is awesome. that good at it's searching? Good. Yeah. Wow, wow. You just say, you know, the format and, uh, you know, like a keyword and it goes right there. And so I assume it's gonna be the same with Alexa, but. That's kind of freaky to have that on all the time without having to push a button or something like that. Yeah, yeah, and yet to the manufacturer, that, that's a big plus because you don't have to power it up or power it down. It's like constantly there. It saves a ton of time, so it is really cool. So that's a big, strong you know, plus side for having a lot of devices that are kind of monitoring us, surveilling us. Yeah. Corey, did you want to say something? I just thought it was funny. There was a, a season premiere of South Park this season. Uh, it was all kind of central around Cartman getting Alexa. And a lot of people who had Alexa, they found out like later that night, there was all this stuff added to their cart because the show would say, Alexa, add this, or Alexa, add that. So they'd go on there and they were like, wait, I didn't add all this stuff. Wow. And it was all just like random stuff like they would say on the show. What a great story, yeah, man. So they picked up the oh, voice God. Of, uh, the cartoon characters. <laughs> Did anybody else hear about that? I, I didn't even know that part. I saw the episode. I, I saw it. Yeah. <laughs> that is pretty amazing. He, he had like 30 Alexis's all going off of each other. Because <laughs> he had them repeating each other. <laughs> OK. Things I have to catch up on. South Park, you know? It's full of good, good information. But that, that's pretty amazing, that story. I've noticed the older the writers get, the more like conscious and like, you know, they're trying to actually base it around things that are happening nowadays. So oh, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Have you guys seen Six Days to Air yeah. while we're talking that's about South Park? Yeah. They're, they're incredible. That's why they're so current. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Six Days to Air is a documentary. I'm sure you can find it uh, somewhere. A documentary on uh, Parker and Stone, the guys who do South Park. And it's, it's pretty amazing. They get it done fast. Man. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I, uh, they, do, they do an episode in a week just like a regular sitcom, except it's all animated. And you just see, you know, as, they, as they're rewriting and rewriting and uh, Oh my God, this is a tough one. It's amazing how they're the way they work. Yeah. It's stressful. And so they can be topical because they're so close to the air date that they, they you know, they didn't they plan this a year and a half in advance. Yeah, but they only work 18 weeks out of two. Hey, you, you gotta be, if you're rich and, and famous, you know, as well. Yeah. I, I said it helps them with the FCC too. Oh, yeah. oh for um, that. Yeah. Well, in in that in that doc, you see the you one of the line producers on the phone saying, "I think he's gonna say, you know," and then there's so they negotiating. Ask, please, and they're yeah. like, "Yeah, no," and they're like, "All right, that's pretty much it." Was there something else? But yeah, I was just gonna say a, a good example of that was uh, Obama being elected. Tuesday, it happened Tuesday night, and then the next night they had uh, in the South, new South Park episode actual quotes from his acceptance speech. Wow. The night Recorded. Before. Yeah, yeah. Not bad. That's real time. That's cool. What was I thinking? Oh, yeah, just in terms of um, back to the Internet of Things. But, uh, um, and again, you know, however, let's, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's, let's save some of that to Wednesday, hopefully, just while we're talking about Internet of Things and, and the coming sort of constantly on responsive types of devices that, that we're probably going to see. I mean, everyone's preparing that. 
Um, yeah, but so so there's a there, there's an argument that all of that can run on the existing infrastructure and and standards that are that are out there for um, uh, for the internet basically, and and so. Um, that was just to come back and give you more of what I've learned about uh, standards and uh, internet protocol and, and the, the, the uses of each of these uh, that I was able to find out at your behest. Um, and since we're talking, since we're talking uh, cell phones and stuff uh, on this, so we're talking mobile access to, uh, to the internet, TCP IP and HTTP are also used uh, through, uh, you know, for your phone, accessing data through the internet as well. So, but here in your phone, there are additional considerations beyond what you'd have in a laptop in the sense that uh, you, you can't have, uh, you, you've got to design stuff that will not suck the battery so fast that can, uh, you know, have a phone that lasts more than, I think the 1973 phone lasted 20 minutes of charge or something like that, that big brick that we were talking about. So uh, obviously everyone's frustrated with their current smartphone, you know, like oh, only last six hours, eight hours or something. But that in itself is a huge achievement in terms of, of creating, you know, uh, apps and apps that don't suck the, the, uh, the battery power so much through a lot of processing. That's why I came up with uh, lithium. Right. The battery designs as well, right? Which is which is important, but uh, it's also it's also the chips that draw less energy, uh, and even uh, you know the the uh, the protocols for data exchange. Um, if if everything was running off of Wi-Fi, uh, you'd have like really fast uh, data exchange, but it also Wi-Fi takes a lot of energy from your phone. So, so what they're working on also is, is uh, um, uh, strategies just like the, you know, the least amount of data transferring, which with the least amount of processing happening in the phone uh, versus what happens in the cloud. You know, so, so again, the idea is, is the thing in your hand uh, is doing the least amount of work possible, so it is draining less energy out of it. But nonetheless, the phones and tablets are super sophisticated, you know, devices with powerful processors in them. But part of it has been just to try to, to make them as efficient as possible. You know? The other thing is, is more and more people are looking at, um, you know, uh, one size doesn't fit all, basically. It's like the, 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 the most data intensive stuff you're doing with your phone is streaming video or especially video. Um, so that requires a quality of connection uh, far above even, you know, uh, uh, driving directions and stuff like that. And of course, down at, by the time you're exchanging texts, you really don't need a, a you know, a, a very uh, fast data connection in order to, to communicate with text and stuff like that. Uh, so, so, you know, part of what the, uh, the designers are doing is trying to make sure that you're using, you know, you're using uh, uh, a, a service that's appropriate for the kinds of data transfers that you need, you know. Um, so Wi-Fi is the 802.11ac is the current standard. That's what you have at home. Uh, you may have, if you have older devices, they'll also connect to the 802.11 Wi-Fi standard. They just won't go as fast. And so it's, it's good for uh, transferring movies. Uh, you can stream a movie over Wi-Fi at home, obviously. Otherwise, you know, a lot of, your, a lot of us are, uh, you know, uh, like Chromecasting or something like that. For, you've got it on your laptop. You cast it over your television or stuff like that. So all of that is taking advantage of the the high bit rates of, of Wi-Fi. But you also have in all your devices Bluetooth, which is a lower bit rate, which is uh, you know, used for peripherals like a mouse or a, a wireless keyboard. Uh, so these, these types of, uh, this, this connection is gonna be slower, uh, but for a lot of applications, it's, it's absolutely adequate. You know? So the idea is, uh, Using, using the connection that uh, has the right amount of data throughput for, for what you want. And currently they're working on Bluetooth low energy, uh, which is low power and low bit rate. So this, for instance, with a, with a, a BLE equipped phone, 
would just allow your battery to last longer. But the other thing is that uh, it, um, it still follows a standard that is out there with Bluetooth in almost every device, laptops, cell phones, etc. So, so that's an important thing as, you know, in the sense that if we have standards that are clear, that are established, then people can build stuff for those standards. And so there's always a kind of a, a, an, early mo you know, an early period where those standards are coming out. And there's, there's an advantage to you know, having an established standard because then everybody can design for that. I guess the, the other possibility is that you, know, you decide you're going to create a whole line of products with your, your own standard that you're going to, you know, if anyone wants it, they have to license it and pay money to you. And, you know, that's another strategy, but you wind up sort of all on your own at that point. Um, how, how many, do we have Android users here? Android? Oh, okay. All right. But that would mean that everybody else, either they don't have a phone or well, they're probably on Apple OS, you know. So um, did you guys notice a difference in the kind of strategies, the way that the apps are, are uh, well, I mean, I, it, as I remember it, Apple was a lot more restrictive about who could make apps for their phones. And, uh, uh, you know, you had to get them all through the Apple store, stuff like that. Is that still going on, Android users? Are you, like... Uh, they have the Google Play. Google Play, okay. It's, it's basically the same setup, I would say. I don't even use apps, so I, I wouldn't know about the companies. But with the way it's set up, yeah, they just have the iStore. Whatever it's called on Apple, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, and then yeah. Google yeah. Play. So it's yeah. the same kind of setup. Interesting. So it, so yeah. So. But right from the start with Apple, you had to go through their own portal. Versus with Android, I remember, there was like a ton of apps available. And you kind of had yeah. to check out, check out you know, the reviews or stuff. Because you know, they, weren't, they weren't like vetted in advance. I have an iPad. And yeah. It goes right to it. You know, there was, I've had to the it, store, I've to the right iTunes. To it, yeah. yeah. So. Gino, you want to say something? Yeah, they're kind of making it a requirement for you to have a Gmail now. Uh, so if you want to really use an Android to its fullest capability, uh, the first thing they do off the bat is ask you for your Google account, and then they're okay. like, "Well, if you don't have one, you can make one," mm -hmm. and then that's how you download apps through the Play Store. Otherwise, you can't. Yeah, you have a really hard time yeah. even setting your phone up if you buy a new Android. If you yeah. Don't have a Google. Yeah. or Gmail. Yeah. I, I mean, Apple's the same thing. You have, you know, this this Apple account password and stuff you have to put in. Yeah. yeah. Similar. Yeah. yeah. Well, they're all building a total picture of you and all of your, you know. It's like a monopoly in a way. It's continue. Yeah, that's interesting. It's, it's Apple and Android stuff. It's their own kingdom. Uh, Pretty much. I, I see what you mean. I mean, basically, as you're 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 entering into like a you know a kind of a restricted zone of of uh, of, of apps and of uh, but but I, to me, what they're after is you know a total picture of your your browsing history and your interests and your buying and, and all of it. Totally agree that. But the the other option is to write down every single phone number and name, jot it down, and then when you buy a new phone put it all back into the phone versus just having it in a safety account when you get a new phone. It's, it's so you're saying the convenience of it is going to, like, obviously... That, that's why people do it. It's for the yeah. convenience of it. It's all tied. Oh, I have, all my songs are still here. All this stuff is still here. I don't have to right. worry about losing it. Right, right, yeah. Which, it's true. You amass an enormous amount of sort of digital assets through all of this. Yeah, yeah. If, if they're not helping you keep a hold of it, it's going to be more difficult. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Okay, that's interesting. I mean, the other thing that people were always, uh, I mean, the, the idea was that Apple was more of a, uh, more restrictive in the choice of partners to create apps for the phone. Uh, and also, um, you know, and this goes way back to, for instance, Apple, ever heard of Firewire, for instance? Anyone who was a video editor? Uh, Firewire was an alternative bus uh, protocol, like so you had a USB bus and your keys, right? Uh, Apple would, they'd have their very own, you know, and only Apple would use them. And so if you were an Apple user, you'd have to, like, use this thing. Even Thunderbolt, which, you know, they put forward, which is one of the fastest connections now. Uh, I think USB 3 has finally caught up with it. Anyhow, so it, it was, Apple seemed to have a, a, a 
seemed to be very ready to create its very own standards for a lot of different hardware and for software and to kind of close off the partners who could, you know, create apps and stuff versus Google, Android, which always seemed more open for that. Um, and of course, PCs in general would be, you know, I mean, Windows had the operating system, but a lot of manufacturers made PCs, and, and so that was more of an open type of uh, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. business too, I guess. You know. So, so I think those persist. Uh, the only thing is that you know, even even different cell phone operators who go with Android uh, will take part of the Android operating system and then customize it their own way. Like AT and T customizes iOS on my phone, uh, so that I get something that's a little different, and everyone gets something that's a little different, and in that way they make it proprietary, even if it is something quite standard that everyone can design for. By the time the phone operator gets a hold of it, then they kind of customize it and stuff. So, interesting. Oh yeah, cellular data terms. So the other thing we're probably going to talk about, it's just an explanation of what the G's are. Uh, you know, we've, we've heard about 1G, 2G, 3G, 4G. So this, um, this is a real nice thing, nicely laid out. Uh, Infomercial by Qualcomm, who is a big chip manufacturer for uh, mobile, um, just explaining uh, what what the G's stood for at their time, and uh, I'll, I'll leave it up there so that you guys can uh, look more into this if you're interested, or otherwise we'll just look at it for a sec. But um, um, so, so first of all, the G's are marketing terms. They're not actual standards themselves. The G refers to generation. So it would be like first generation, second generation, third and fourth generation. And then underneath here are the actual standards, which you know, are, it, the level of complexity here is such we don't, you know, we don't need to, to, to actually study this. But you'll all recognize from your phone like the LTE symbol there, which shows you when you've uh, connected to uh, a network that's fast enough for LTE speeds and stuff. So um, obviously, <laughs> what, what we can see here is each generation um, leads to faster data exchange. But also, there are some significant changes in the, in, in the underlying technology that are simple enough for, for me to understand anyway to, to talk to you about. Um, so your first generation mobiles, with those great big phones, those were actually analog connections. Um, so you know, we said they, they, weren't, the, they weren't packet switched, right? So uh, they, they uh, um, required, they were circuit switched. So when you made a call, you were tying up an entire circuit for your phone call, which would mean very limited uh, uh, amounts of calls could go over the allocated bandwidth. So these, at this point, people are thinking this is for business. The phone costs ten thousand dollars. This is going to be a very limited type of service where we don't have to worry about millions of people, you know, uh, at once making calls and searching for stuff. Um, second generation. Um, which I recognize the GSM standard, which is something that was in, in Europe, and, uh, and CDMA, which uh, we have here, the first generation of CDMA. Um, so uh, this is a, a, a digital standard, so using digital voice, and you could exchange text, simple data. Um, so you can see that the speeds at uh, half a mega, uh, megabit per second data transfer. So that's, that's uh, really quite slow compared to what we got now. Um, somewhere in the midst of 2G, uh, they switched over to packet switching. And the um, cellular data uh, exchange transfer got a lot better. Um, so they're compressing voice, squeezing more calls into a, uh, 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 the, the same amount of bandwidth that they had before. Um, you're, you're also uh, 
like, yeah, my God, this thing goes into more detail than we could cover, certainly in a talk. Um, check it out, just in terms of, of managing how you transfer a call from one tower to another, uh, and so on and so forth. Well, <laughs> check that out, because that, that gets to a lot of complexity. But I kind of simplified it here <laughs> in a way that I could at least speak to. Uh, so uh, in, in second generation, you got into um, uh, it's, it's digitized voice. It's encrypted. You've got some uh, text and multimedia message abilities. And with 2.5G, everything switched to a packet switch network, uh, which is both compatible with the internet, and so the packets can originate uh, in a wired situation and be sent out wirelessly as well. So uh, at, uh, at this point in 2.5G, um, you're, you're getting into uh, the, uh, the kind of compatibility with the internet, which makes a really smooth interface and transfer of data. Right? Get to 3G, which is typically what your phone will run now if it's, if, it's not, uh, if it's not saying 4G LTE, you're running in a 3G uh, with speeds uh, that are making possible streaming of radio and perhaps low resolution television signal. Uh, and you're moving above three megabits per second. So that's about half as fast as your typical Wi-Fi uh, at home, which is still pretty fast if you're out there mobile. Uh, so at this point, it's, uh, it's possible to have apps uh, that will stream video, like a YouTube app or a Netflix app. They can function at, at, this, at this speed. Um, and finally, we get to the 4G fastest data transfers yet. As fast as or faster than a lot of broadband connections in the home, you can stream a movie. You know, this is the, the gold standard right now in terms of data transfer. Uh, these 4G LTEs are in big urban areas, but not so much in the rest of the country. So when you travel, I mean, you're probably most of the time you're not seeing uh, 4G speeds. Mason? If you go to New Mexico, I have a friend that lives out there and he's got, he lives with people who are on a ranch and no internet, no oh boy. anything. Oh they gosh. TV. They have satellite TV or they're just not interested? It's not interested. They're thinking about getting fiber wire or fiber optic in there. That would take a lot of wire. Oh, okay. Uh, They'd have to lay but it they're themselves. just kind of like, how do you do it, man? It's yeah, it's, a different, it's like, a different life. I don't have anything. Yeah, it's crazy to yeah. think that it's just nowhere to be found. Because I always thought Wi-Fi, 4G, I'm like, isn't it just kind of in the air? You know, like, cause you can't ever really explain it, really. But I was like, well, it's not. Yeah, it's crazy. yeah. Wow. Well, they could get a, you know, a satellite and uh, yeah, get, sure. get slow internet that yeah. way. It's, it's, they get TV and slow internet that it's way. crazy. Huh. Different. Yeah. Way of life, yeah. Can you explain the last uh, bullet point a little bit? As far as 4G the... treatment of voice calls, just like any other type of streaming audio. Yeah, like prior to that, the the they they were using uh, like compression techniques to compress the voice data, uh, which were different than like this compression techniques you'd use in an MP3 or something like that. So voice had to be treated uh, as a as a separate uh, uh, entity and. and <coughs> The packets were um, exclusive of any other type of data. So it was still packet switching before, but it was just it was its own thing. As of 2.5G, yeah, packet switching for everything, but uh, voice would be treated like in its in its own way. Versus once you get to 4G LTE, you can yeah it it can it can it doesn't distinguish between the types of data for compression. It's all so it, it, what it what it makes it is it makes it. Um, uh, easier to for um, different different wide area networks, different different operators to connect with other operators. Like if you travel in another country or something like that, uh, if everyone's using their own proprietary way of compressing and decompressing voice, it limits the ability to go from one service to another. So versus the unification standards. 
Exactly, yeah. So at that point, it just makes it easier for everybody to do the same thing, which is ultimately, I'd, I'd say, best for innovation, best for operators too, because then they're not limited in their partnerships that they can, you know, they can go, they can, they can partner with whoever because the, the data standards are all the same. That's, that's as much as I know about it. There could be more to it than that. Um, wow, so a, a lot on standards, um, and check this out. I'm sure it has more than you'd ever want to know about, about the difference between the G's uh, and, uh, and, and where all of that is, is going now. I guess we kind of, this, this uh, heading here uh, would take us out of the, um, out of the kind of technology-based conversation we're having, more towards users and what they think about it. We kind of verged on this a little bit as we were saying, like what, what are our responses to the idea that uh, the Internet of Things could you know, soon uh, bring so many capture and monitoring devices into our lives that you know, how, how do we feel about that? Um, and, and it gets to the, I guess, to the idea that uh, um, it's not just technology, it's also how people view the technology and what they're willing to you know, put up with in terms of privacy, but also what they're expecting the technology to provide. You know? So um, it, uh, it, it leads to an idea that there, you know, there are sort of resistances to new technologies that either society or manufacturers have to help us through. Um, so we talked about the privacy uh, hurdles, but what about the idea just in, um, and, and, and here it was, would speak, think about when you first were thinking of getting a smartphone and what your attitude was it, it to, to start out with. Did you have any resistance to the idea that you'd spend a whole lot of money or you know something beyond a phone, or was it really exciting the idea of what you could do with a phone? I see Richard's nodding there. What was your experience, Richard? I was really really excited. Is that were you an early like uh, smartphone adopter? Um, I guess. Do you remember like what? Well, what I generation? started using with like the, the new Nokia's. Okay. And then as soon as iPhone came out, I was like all about it. Okay. Okay. Because I already had an iPod. For a second gen, I was already into that, so. That's true, right? We didn't even touch on iPods in my list. I was talking about PDAs, but not you know personal entertainment systems like iPods. Mm -hmm. True. That must have smoothed the way. Yeah. yeah. Other folks, did was there like a resistance to like ah, I don't need that. Why would I want that? I can. You certainly said oh. that about the on the Apple Watch and. Okay. Oh, there it is. Yeah, I have it, so. <laughs> okay. Who needs that? Just an Apple Watch. Now I'm like, well, like, you know, count, watch my breathing and, like, keep track of calories. <laughs> oh, yeah. More data on you. You know, it's pretty nice. <laughs> Make right. phone calls like I'm still a or there. something. Yeah. Yeah. And wearables, again, it, it, it also opens up a whole new range of experiences that, you know, it's interesting. I, I haven't gotten over that hurdle yet. Yeah, I was going to say that I don't think it was so much a not for me kind of thing, but a more so just barrier to entry of whether it be price or uh, even the uh, just the yeah, it was mainly mainly the price and then also just hearing kind of a negative feedback. I was like, ah, it's a little slow, a little sluggish, it doesn't go on the internet as fast as you want it to go and little things like that. I was like, okay, I can wait to the future. And then as the years went on, it's like, okay, now I'm ready to adopt a smartphone. Yeah, I think that was just mainly the, the big hang up for me on my experience, yeah. Mm. Uh -huh. yeah. I was concerned about the battery usage, battery life, because mm -hmm. I had one of the phones where the text messaging, you kind of go into, uh, let's do this, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, one, two. <laughs> Texting like that, and battery would be gone very quickly because of that. Mm -hmm. Whereas mm -hmm. now my battery, I have a Mophie that charges wherever I want it to charge. What, so what's a Mophie? Uh, it's its own battery pack. Oh, okay. Like so. And you can charge it while you're charging your actual phone at home. Okay. Stuff like that. So it's like a like an additional battery, additional yeah. power source. Interesting. So, I mean, to, to consider this in the 90s, people would think I was like a crazy person. 
<laughs> yeah, you can have your own battery uh, with you. you Extra know. battery. Interesting. Okay, cool. There's, a, there's this uh, approach that I studied in, in my graduate studies called SCOT, Social Construction of Technology. And I do have uh, one SCOT analysis of uh, actually of the a TiVo-like device that I actually did myself. But of course, that's kind of way back. But um, I'll bring you some examples next class. But what this is, is it's a way, it, it's the idea that the best technology doesn't always win out. Uh, and, uh, uh, and so there are social factors as to which tech actually, uh, you know, catches on. And, and one of the things that they, uh, Scott looks at is sort of like all the resistances, the social resistances to the adoption of a new technology and how, how they go beyond it. Um, so, uh, you know, in my analysis of, uh, of, of the, uh, the TiVo-like uh, um, uh, digital video recorder, you know, you, the idea is just to kind of map out, well, who is opposed to this and why? So you'd have the industry who would be opposed to it because it promoted, you know, recording the digital files and sharing them. You'd have users who, you know, uh, and, and you can find this in just in what people are saying about the, about the devices, you know. Everyone was talking about, you know, well, my VHS is, the, the little light is still blinking on the front, you know, because for the, for the time. This was, this was the cliche of the day that, that users were lost due to the complexity of these things. They couldn't even set their devices up to, of course, display the right time. Versus now, everything, you know, takes its time signal from the internet. So it's like that's not an issue anymore, you know. So, so the idea of Scott is, is to, to basically to kind of draw a little, a little map here. If you, if you had the technology, and this could be even an app, you know, like a, like a, let's say a fitness app, you know, and then you could sort of map out, well, who are the interested partners here? You know, your doctor might want you to use it. Uh, and, uh, you know, um, personal trainer. sorry, personal trainer. your personal trainer, right? So, and, and you could have, uh, health, health, uh, um, products, you know, uh, stuff like that. Um, so, so the idea is to kind of map out all the stakeholders and then there's a, there are additional things as to, okay, uh, so your doctor, likes it because you could monitor your heart rate or something like that. Um, but somebody else, a user, might have a problem with it. And for that, we would have a different type of icon. The user might have a problem with it due to, uh, I don't know, concern about privacy. So, uh, you know, if, uh, if my health insurer finds out that I have a heart tremor or something, uh, will I have to eventually pay more money for my health insurance? So do I really want that? Uh, so, you know, I mean, that's a little far-fetched. But um, believe me, the, one of the, one of the, the seminal uh, Scott studies is the bicycle. Like, just believe it or not, there, was like, there were like social groups who were absolutely opposed to bicycles. It would give women too much mobility. Uh, it, seriously, seriously, like they, you know, they go down on record about. It. I mean, people in Parliament in England were saying, you know, no good. So it, it's it's an it's it you know what it does is it leads you to a more detailed analysis of, you know, what what the forces were that were pushing us to adopt a technology and which ones were pushing against and saying no, this is no good and why, and then you can look at it and say, well you know, uh, how did they fight the fight about privacy? How did they win the fight about privacy? You know? And uh, I think in the room today, one thing that came up is just, you know, the sheer convenience of it is, and, and the ubiquity of it as well. You know, the more people that are just have them, uh, the more you might feel like, hey, I've got, I'm missing something. You know? so, so, you know, the convenience and the ubiquity are a couple of reasons that are pushing us over some other sticking points, you know, that'll, you know, eventually, uh, do you want to be able to dictate your grocery list to a device in your kitchen? Is that easier than, you know, and then, you know, have it delivered by drone and <laughs> all the rest of it? Yeah. So maybe you do, uh, maybe you don't. But, so Scott, I'll, I'll bring something in next class. To, 
can maybe look at it a bit more. So next class, I think we're talking more about the Internet of, of Things. Uh, and uh, of course, we'll uh, try to get some exam questions out in front of you just to uh, make sure of that. So exam period is not next week, but the week after. We'll get into, we'll do a review of we'll the exam. So next week, we're doing that advertising thing. And uh, just, you know, again, your presence in class is not required, but uh, I'll let you know more about that on Thursday, I hope. Yeah. When you say exam, do you mean uh, your next test or midterm? Well, well, it's a midterm. Yeah, yeah. So we have two quizzes, a midterm and a final. And so midterm is not next week, but the week after. Quiz two will be after the midterm. Uh, quiz two will be, yeah, like way towards the end of the semester. Okay, thanks, guys.